Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this next hour where we learn how to pray better for the global church. It's my joy to introduce two um, dear friends and uh, teachers that I've learned so much from since I've met them a few years back. Um, Pastor Jerry Pillay is a Presbyterian minister in South Africa. He's also the moderator of the World Communion of Reformed Churches. Um, it's a new organization that houses reformed um, churches across how many countries? 190 countries uh, with about 80 million members. So um, uh, we pray for God's wisdom and blessing as he, as he leads in this critical time, um, this critical organization. And it's also my joy to introduce to you Judy Musomos, um, Judith, who is a Filipina living and teaching in Singapore. She is the acting director of the church worship and music program at um, the Methodist School of Theology, uh, right at the heart of Singapore. Um, and she brings with her all the effectiveness, efficiency, and punctuality of the Singaporeans, but also all the warmth and hospitality and kind caringness of uh, the Filipinos. So we're very pleased to have both of them here. I would say so much more about them, but our time is limited. So I would rather that they had that chance to either say more about themselves or more about the context they come from and help us how to pray um, for those contexts as well. So would you join me in welcoming them? We'll start with Jerry and then Judith. They'll each take about 20 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for question and answer afterwards. And now you can join me in welcoming them. <laughs> Good day. It's a joy and a privilege to have this opportunity just to share briefly with you. And um, if you were at the plenary uh, on prayer, you would realize that these sessions are actually a little bit more in-depth, trying to focus on specific countries and looking at those countries itself, but also asking what are some of the things that we can pray for as we think about the global village. And I'm specifically going to be talking about South Africa because that's the country from which I come. But I thought as I make this presentation, I'll try to be a good reformed pastor. So I'll start a little bit with the word. And I just want to do a very quick reflection on, um, on Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Uh, there, there we go. Uh, I'm not going to read the passage for the sake of time, but for those of you are, who are acquainted with this passage, you will remember that Jesus is asked by the disciples to teach them to pray, and he leads them into the Lord's Prayer. But he goes on to also make some very other powerful statements. And he says to them, uh, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give, him, uh, and give him the bread because he is the friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Uh, the, the points that actually emerge from this, this particular story uh, is the fact that it speaks to us firstly about the purpose of prayer. It tells us that prayer points us back to God. Prayer enables us to know that we cannot depend on ourselves, that we have to go to God for answers. Uh, it reminds us that we need divine intervention. And so it speaks about the purpose of prayer. When we pray, we're not just talking uh, to each other. More specifically, we are talking to God. And when we turn to God, the actual aspect of turning to God in itself is a very strong directive that speaks about motivation. It speaks, speaks about the fact that when I'm turning to God, that I am purposefully looking to God for a particular situation. And I'm sure that as we think about the different situations from which we come, be it a personal experience in terms of family and home, or even country, there are many, many times in our lives when we had to pur purposefully turn to God. And that's what prayer intentionally does for us helps us to focus on God, helps us to remember 
that we need something, someone beyond ourselves, we need to turn to God. And the second word that for, for me that emerges out of this passage is perseverance or persistence in prayer. That sometimes we don't get it at the first time, we don't get it at the second time. We don't even get it a hundred times down the line. But that does not stop us from coming to God. That does not stop us from believing persistently that God will make a way, that God will save the day, that God will come through for us. So persistence in prayer, perseverance in prayer, is an important dimension for any person who believes in God, that we've got to tend to God constantly. And if it doesn't happen today, that doesn't mean we must stop praying. We will continue to pray and continue to pray and continue to pray. And these are some of the things that we have experienced in the South African context. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on. So not only do we see in this passage the purpose of prayer or perseverance and persistence in prayer, that we will get up and give you because of the persistence, the persisting nature, the demands that I would need to respond. And that's how we see God working in this passage. And so the third thing I see in this passage is the promise in prayer. I didn't quite read those verses to you, but it says, if you ask, it will be given to you. If you seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. Those are promises that as we continue to turn to God and continue to ask of God, God will come through for us. The promises will be kept and we will see the reality of that in our lives sometime on the journey. It may not be in this moment or in this instant. It may not be in this year or the next. But the time will come when we will see how God delivers God's promises to us. And in the South African context, we have seen that. We have prayed for many, many years, sometimes not even believing that we will see the light of day. But those kind of persistent prayer helped us to cling to the promises of God that one day it will be true. And one day, in many instances, it has become true for us. And then the passage for me ends with power in prayer. Is that we see God at work. We see that which is impossible suddenly becomes possible. We see that which was unimaginable suddenly become a reality. I remember when I was a little boy, not a little boy, but when I was at school and even at university, we would sing a song, Nelson Mandela will be king and wear the crown. And sometimes we would sing that song not just believing it at all because we thought it was impossible. But the power in prayer is reflected in the fact that God actually brings into being the things that we sometimes pray for in unbelief or disbelief, but yet suddenly see the reality of that in the awesome power of God to make something that we thought would be impossible so much possible. So with that as the background in terms of, the South Africa, uh, uh, of, of prayer and the approach that we want to take to prayer as we think about the need for intercessory prayer and as we think about the need for praying for people across the globe, for people in different countries with different experiences. And there are many, many countries that are going through really serious difficulties at this time. Political instability, economic crisis, violence, war, conflicts, between politicians and conflicts between people, ethnic violence and so forth, and the list can actually go on. So how do we, wherever we live and wherever we come from, be part of this global prayer network? How can we connect with people from North America, with people in South Africa? We don't have to physically be there, but we can come to God in prayer. And through this prayer connection and network, we can bring people from the ends of the earth into our daily life experience as we remember them before God. Now, in the South African context, you would remember apartheid. Apartheid was a separate development policy that was instituted mainly by the white Africana uh, people in South Africa. And it was a separate development, meaning that white folk, black folk, Indian folk, and so-called colored folk will all develop separately. But it was only a matter of time, very quickly indeed, when it became racial discrimination. So separate development meant that people according to different skin color were treated in a particular way. And the majority of people in our country were oppressed and were discriminated because of the color of the skin. 
So we would go into public. There were certain facilities that we will not be able to use. It would say whites only, blacks only. And so this particular distinction became separation, separation of people, one from the other, separation in terms of culture, separation in terms of where people lived, separation in terms of what jobs were given to people and availed to them, a differentiation in terms of being professional and being skilled laborers or just laborers. And so all of these things, our education, our way of life, every aspect in our life was actually brought into being by this oppressive structures, the systemic violence, which violated the rights of individuals because of the skin color. And I'm sure many of you know the background in terms of apartheid. And so you've read about it, you've heard stories about it, but I think many people know it because of Nelson Mandela, and that's why I put his name on the screen. Some people, you say to them, South Africa? They don't quite know something about South Africa. But when you mention Nelson Mandela, immediately they know South Africa. And Nelson Mandela has been one of those leaders for us who has actually made wonderful transitions in our country by bringing black and white together, by enabling us to move forward without a bloody revolution in bringing change where people can come together. Not that all of those things are gone. Those realities still prevail. But we are working with these things, and we are seeking transformation in the midst of all of that. And as you all probably know, uh, Nelson Mandela passed away at the end of last year, and our country mourned the loss of a great leader. But we also celebrated the life of a man that God had given to us and for the things that he had imparted to us and for the things that he had done which helped us to find a way forward in South Africa in the midst of so many things that still has to be rectified and addressed and redressed. But yet he was able to bring people of color, uh, black and white and across the board, together to try and live in a society and in a country that can move forward in a positive way. And I'm sure, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the, the movie that has come out recently, The Long Walk to Freedom. Um, yes, I've seen a few people have. And that tells some of the story of the history of South Africa. And if you want to learn more about it, about South Africa, it might be good for you to try to see that movie if it is screened wherever you are found. And so we have the ANC government that came into, into, into power uh, in the new democratic uh, South Africa and have been in power since 1994. And we have indeed experienced many, many changes in South Africa through this political party, through the ANC, which was a liberation movement prior to, to the democracy. And now it continues to actually seek to bring changes in South Africa. And it is true to say, since 1994, since the institution of this new democratic government, we have experienced incredible changes in South Africa. Uh, but changes sometimes do not take place that fast. And economic uh, changes are slower. You've got to address all of these things time and time again and continue to work with them. And so the ANC government continues to lead us and currently we find ourselves in a democracy where we also start to question the leadership of our government. We also start to, as people say, but wait a minute, we don't see some of the things that you have been fighting for, some things that you've struggled for and some things that people have died for. And as we look at the new government and what they do, we question quite seriously whether they are working on the same principles of what others before them had stood for. And so that is always a political tension that continues in terms of our discussions. But our situation continues, and we continue to strive to, to achieve a new South Africa or a South Africa built on democratic values, but a South Africa where all people can find their place where the poor can find the place in society and be empowered so that they can live as people with dignity in the context in which they are found. But one of the things I want to mention, having painted this kind of scenario since 1990, the release of Mandela, and since 1994, the inception of our new democracy, is the role of the church. The church played a very, very right, vital role in the ecumenical, may I describe it as the ecumenical church with the South African Council of Churches, played a very vital role in seeking to dismantle apartheid and also now trying to attempt to reconstruct our country. And in the second phase of it, we don't do so much of a great job that we could possibly do. But the church has played a very vital role. And in this process of the church playing a very vital role, prayer has become, prayer has become the lifeblood 
that has brought us into a new situation. Right from this time, even before then, in the days of apartheid, people were praying against apartheid. Not everybody, not all churches, because some of them were the ones who actually instigated and implemented the laws of apartheid themselves. But the ecumenical church continually thrived in praying, in gathering groups of people, getting Christians to understand what it means to pray, to pray that God will turn the situation in South Africa around so that apartheid would, would be lost and people will live as equal citizens in a country that is beautiful, but as being taken over by minority. And so prayer played a very vital role in the dark days of apartheid. And prayer is really what was backing up the movement of what our leaders were doing for us when many people were not able to do for themselves. And so in South Africa, we have a great movement with transformation. There are groups and bodies of people that pray. There are regular prayer meetings called by the ecumenical church. There are regular prayer meetings called by congregations and denominations where prayer becomes a big thing. Uh, in our current situation, we are now going to be having our elections again uh, this year. And you can already start to see that pockets and circles of groups are starting to gather to pray about the situation in South Africa, starting to pray that the elections will be free and fair and it'll be what God really wants in our country and the leaders that will be chosen will be the leaders that we want who represents godly values and so forth. So the role of play is enormous in terms of South Africa in the days of apartheid, but more so now even in, this day of, in these days of reconstruction, of development and of uh, bringing to being a South Africa that everybody can be pleased about and say, this is truly my country. We still obviously haven't got all things together and we will continue to strive to get them as we go along in our journeys as most countries do worldwide. But as I round up, I just want to focus on some prayer points. And in these prayer points, probably share with you a couple more things that we could focus on in terms of our prayer for South Africa. And we wanna give thanks. And I think prayer is often about giving thanks. Uh, I spoke you, to you about the passage in terms of, of Luke 11. And there are different forms of prayer. You know, we can confess, prayer of confession, prayer of thanksgiving, uh, all of those things. But it is important to give thanks to God. It is important to acknowledge the things that God has done uh, before we move on to something else and bring to God our grocery list and say, Lord, these are the things we want, strike. These are the things we need, strike. And very often we as human beings tend to work that way. We go to God with this grocery list and expect God to provide that. Uh, we fail to stop and to appreciate and celebrate the things that God has done and God has given. And I think it is important that even in our personal praise and in our intercessory praise, in our public praise, in worship and elsewhere, that we stop to give thanks to God for whatever our situation is. Even in difficulty, as the word says to us, in everything, give thanks. And so we give thanks to God for the changes in South Africa. We know that things still has to work on, still has to be improved on. We know we're still on a journey and we will possibly not even get there fully. As we think we arrive, we realize that we have more steps to move forward on. And so that will be a reality for any country in any part of the world. And so we give thanks for the changes. We give thanks for leaders that God had raised, people like Nelson Mandela, people like Steve Biko, people like Oliver Tambo, and, and the likes of them, who have blessed us sacrificially by taking stands, stands and stances that have enabled us to come to a place where South Africa has been set free from apartheid. Although some of those things and those remnants are still there and still lives with us, but by and large, we are now a community or country of people moving on a different track. And so we give thanks to God. We realize that these people are not there by chance. These people were given to us as God's gift to express courage and to courageously move forward in bringing us into a new place. If you get a chance to see the movie Long Walk to Freedom, you will see the role Nelson Mandela played. In the midst of criticism, he had to actually exercise courage and he even went against views or expressions of thoughts by his fellow colleagues who disagreed with him on certain things and, and how one should actually seek to change South Africa. But it is people like these who have played a very vital role and have brought us to where we are now in our country. At this present moment, as we move into elections, one of the things that we are really praying for are deeply spiritual and moral leaders. 
Some of our leaders in our government at the moment leave little to be desired when we look at the lives and the lifestyles and when we look at some of the things that they've been doing for their own uh, enrichment and some of the things that they've been doing for their, entire, for their own families and building things uh, for themselves uh, with millions of money, uh, millions of rand being used from South African revenues, we get worried about these things and we ask these kind of questions. What are these leaders all about? Where's the integrity of this? Should they not be giving instead of wanting to always receive? Are they expressing good moral standards and are they exemplifying good character and characteristics that our young people can actually uh, uh, see and enjoy and desire? And some of those things concern us, not just in South Africa, worldwide, in most countries. We often put questions on our leaders because they are not necessarily examples to be followed. So in as much as we pray for that in South Africa, I'm sure that you pray for that even in your own countries, for deeply spiritual and moral leaders who will lead our people and be an example to our young people and to all of our society and country so that we may indeed follow the right things, uh, embrace the right values, seek the right destinations, have the right visions, work towards human dignity, and work towards the growth and upliftment of others and the community. I have already mentioned the fact that we are having national elections, and these are coming up. They will be in April this year. And we do ask you to cover your prayers for, for this, that especially now as we look at the political parties, uh, there are some concerns about, about new parties. There are some concerns about the ANC, which is our leading party, having two-thirds majority. Uh, and some of the decisions that they've been making has become questionable in that process. So we're praying that God will lead us into a place where uh, parties that are elected and the strength on which they are elected will also show us how we can move forward as a country in struggle, continuing to struggle and continuing to strive for best and for a de real democracy in our land itself. So another important area to pray for is the unity and witness of the churches. Now, one of the things that we've had in South Africa is that the current president uh, a few years ago instituted or was the background person behind the constitution of a new body. The body of the SACC, the South African Council of Churches, has been the ecumenical body, respected body, and the member churches who are part of that have led South Africa and led the church in South Africa through apartheid and now even through our democracy. But the SACC refused to rubber stamp everything in terms of our leaders. We first took a position of critical solidarity as we came into a democracy. And then some of us were very quick to realize that we were more in solidarity than we were critical. And so we then changed the wording to say critical engagement. And now the government doesn't quite like that. They don't quite like when we say to them, we don't like what you're doing. We will not support these policies or we, we have struggles with what you actually are saying, the lives that you are living, the examples that you are setting. And so the president actually helped initiate another movement of Christians, uh, supposedly in conflict uh, with the ecumenical movement in South Africa uh, from the roots of the SACC. And we're struggling with that. And so for the last two years, we've had movements and splinter movements, and we are in the process of working together now to bring it back to a single voice, because that's what we had and enjoyed, a single voice of the churches working together, a prophetic voice of churches working together. And now we have splinter groups of different people speaking against each other as the churches and not helping the cause of Christian unity. So we do covet you to pray for the unity and witness of the churches so that we could speak with one voice, exercise our prophetic giftings together, our priestly giftings, giftings together, so that we can actually lead the people in our land, not just Christians, but all people and citizens in our land in a way that God wants us to lead them. And then finally, as I close, one of the big things of our government is the national development policy, uh, which is the, what they are using now to reconstruct South Africa in this democracy. And they are working with a number of different factors uh, that actually build and develop society education being one of the most important ones, health being another important one, and public services, and so on. And they started to do some serious work in terms of putting this together, which they have managed to do uh, by the end of last year. Now they are in the process of implementation. And, that, and they are finding that implementation is not as easy 
as they thought it would be. But one of the good things that we give thanks for is the fact that they are realizing time and time again that they cannot implement just as government. They need other role players to make this possible and practical. And so, consequently, they are turning to the churches and saying to the church, we do need you to make this workable. And so God works in mysterious ways. God makes people to realize that if you want to go on a journey and if you want to go somewhere effectively, that you have to have other partners with you in making things possible. So we hope and pray that the church will continue to play a vital role, but that the church will not just play a role of rubber stamping what government does, but the church will critically engage what government says to us, not for ourselves, but for the majority of people, for the people in South Africa. One of the things that we find in our economy is that the rich are getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And I'm sure you could say the same for yourselves. But how do we as church speak truth into that? How do we prophetically become the voice of God as we stand up and become with the poor, the voice of the poor, as we defend the rights of those who continue to suffer injustices in different ways? So in a nutshell, in a summary form, this is a background to South Africa. But as I conclude, I conclude on a positive note. God has done wonders, and our prayer is that God will continue to do great wonders and miracles as we continue to develop South Africa. Thank you. God bless. Good morning, everyone. Um, I thank the organizers of the symposium for giving the Philippines a voice in the symposium. And um, I would like to introduce myself as Charles did. He said he had to do it uh, saying the different tribes or clans that he comes from. I'm, he said the clans, I'm doing it with my tribal cloth. I was supposed to wear my father, this is my father's clan. He's an Ibaloy. My, my sister thought I'd grown thinner, so I couldn't wear it. <laughs> yeah. He's a, my father is an Ibaloy. Let me show that. I am from the north of the Philippines. Oops. How do I go back? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes. Um, on their left hand, there's Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. I'm sure some of you have heard that the Philippines is composed of three uh, big islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And I'm from Luzon up in the city in Baguio in the north. And I, I come from a tribe, um, two tribes, as I said, my father and Ibaloy, this is a trademark. And my mother, farther up, eight hours from my father's tribe, there are the Bontoks. It's a skirt. It's a skirt, but when, when I gave it as a gift, they use it for tabletop. I would like to start with a psalm It's from one of the tribes, another tribe in the north. And um, I would like to start with this as we are summoned to sing a song unto the Lord. And we come also here to pray for the nations. And um, let's see. I will start by singing. This, the verses, I will ask you to 
do the refrain. I, I, Sally, do my, I, I, Sally, do my, sing with me. I, I, Sally, do my, I, I, Sally, do my, again. I, I, Sally, do my, I, I, Sally, do uh, the rhythm I am playing on the podium is, uh, I'm just copying the rhythm of the gongs. Uh, it's usually a, a six men playing flat gongs. Yeah, so I'm just copying that. Okay, I'll sing the verses and then you sing the refrain. Sing a song, sing a song to the Lord. All the world sing and bless God's name. I, I, Sally, do my. I, I, Sally, do my. Daily sing of God's saving power. Tell all lands of God's wondrous works. I, I, Sally, do my. I, I, Sally, do my. Great is God, worthy of all praise. Worship God high above all things. I, I, Sally, do my. I, I, Sally, do my. Tell the nations God reigns as king, judging with truth and Righteousness, I, I, Sally, do my, I, I, Sally, do my. Um, you might be wondering what is I, I, Sally, do my. Sally, do my. It's a non-lexical syllable. It's like la 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 la, and it takes its meaning from the context that we are using it. And in this um, context, you are saying yes, indeed. Let us sing, let us tell the nations God reigns as king. It's an affirmation. Um, I am a Filipino. There. I am a Filipino and I live in Singapore. I've been there for eight years now. And as I thought about what we should pray about, I specifically go back to my country and I should say thank you very much for all the support all over the world for the support for the victims of the big typhoon Haiyan. But in this prayer session, I would like to focus particularly on a particular group of people to which I also belong. And it comes with a story. So there's Philippines, and that Singapore, a very, very tiny dot. Okay. I am a Filipino. I live in Singapore, and I am an overseas Filipino worker. I am an OFW. It hit me that I am an OFW when I and my family went home to the Philippines. And as we entered, as we approached the immigration, the officer said, who is the OFW? Wow, I am an OFW, that's me. So I told the officer, that's me. In a way, I was upset that he didn't call me by my name. I had a label on my head, I'm an OFW. When it was time to go home to Singapore, home, when it is go, time to go back to Singapore, the o, any OFW will have to go and get an exit clearance. This doesn't make sense to me, but anyway, I comply as a good citizen of the Philippines. Then I found several lines, several OFWs like me, one to pay for this, one to pay for that, one. So there were several lines that I had to go through, I had to pay for, and then I'd get my exit clearance. This means that <clears throat> every time I have to go home, I will have to go through this. That's the OFW. 
At the airport, again, I had to go and surrender my exit clearance so that I can leave the country without any hassle. Now, I want my family to be exempted from travel tax as stated in one of the policies. As the, at the counter, I had to prove they are indeed my family. They asked, where are their birth certificates? And where is your marriage certificate? Who in the world travels with all these documents? We have our passports. They have their IDs from Singapore. Does that not mean that it went through their birth certificates and marriage certificates? Sorry, you have to pay the tax. So we had to do that. That's the OFW. My point is, who are we? The, uh, are we being exploited here? Okay, so what is an OFW? The thing is, you process your work permits, it's like this, you go through one, um, one agency to another, and this has to go through air each time an OFW has to leave the country. Um, history tells us that um, Spain colonized the Philippines for 300 years, but even before they settled in the country, the Philippines has already been um, trading center for China, Japan, Thailand, Cambodia, India, Borneo. The Spaniards continued trade with these countries. When the Spaniards came to the Philippines, our ancestors already had been doing that. And the Spanish government continued trade relations with these countries and Manila became the center of commerce in the east. The Spaniards closed the ports of Manila to all countries except Mexico. Thus, the galleon trade was born. It also allowed liberal ideas to enter the country eventually, inspiring the movement from independence from Spain. And because the Spaniards were so engrossed in making profits, they hardly had any time to further exploit our natural resources. Um, in the year 1900, apple pickers also farm they, they already started coming to the United States through Hawaii. And then this has been going on, going on, until an or unorganized and unmanaged migration to the different countries was there and the. Now they made it more organized, but to the detriment of the society and the people involved. You see, there, you see the different government agencies that people had to go through, and then before you get the stump that you're an OFW and you're ready to leave the country. This is a result of the need for families to support um, the children to go to school. And for the professionals, it's a need for them to advance their careers. <clears throat> Today, there are about um, two million Two million, two million OFWs, these are documented people, and there are undocumented OFWs as well. Yesterday I heard uh, Dr. Navarro mention that there are four million, at least four million um, <clears throat> Filipinos in the United States, and I'm not sure if they're called o o OFWs as well. Um, there is a connotation to who the OFWs are. Um, I think, uh, People who come to the United States are more privileged because um, the, the U.S. government considers the family as a whole so that when you come to the U.S., your family has to come with you. So that's an advantage and that's a privilege that the um, Filipino workers have over other workers that go to other countries. Countries like... Um, Okay, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Middle East, and there are several uh, professions that are represented. Many, many, many of the women, they go for service household works, and they're called the domestic workers. Um, we have factory workers. Now, there are many also from the medical field, 
the clerical workers, sales workers, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> the overseas employment has become the economic lifeline of the country. From mere 36,075 in 1975, there are now two million documented, as I said. And what is the implication of this to the, go to the Philippines? In, to the government, um, the OFW is a hero. They have written that. Um, Remittances, you know, it contributes to the foreign reserve of the country. Remittances from overseas Filipinos reached all-time high to 2.3 billion in October 2013. See, there's a picture, that's one of the pictures of the remittance centers in um, Singapore. And when you go there, it's like, it, it's just so full of all uh, people like me remitting money. To back to the uh, to the to the families that we they support we support okay here the the United Arab Emirates has 185 exchange houses and branches operating more than 10 billion was transferred from UAE in two, two, 2008 so the government is very very happy and encourage people to go out and bring bring back your dollars families or fam families collect their financial support. See banks, Western Union. There's the the, the currency rate. <clears throat> uh, see, they only go. They receive the money and report through Skype. We got it. Poor baby in the hands of another, of the auntie. That's the mother on the on the, on the other hand, on the other end. <clears throat> so you call us the heroes. See, it's, it's in the papers, it's, on, oh, it's online. Overseas Filipino workers, heroes at home, but they are exploited abroad. Overseas Filipino workers or OFW as everyday heroes, unsung heroes. But the implication of this is really terrible. See how many hundreds of people line up just to get a brighter future. Here is a man. He was in OFW for, I cannot believe, 22 years in Saudi Arabia. He and 31 other undocumented OFWs arrived at the airport on a Saturday afternoon. There has been a crackdown in Saudi Arabia for people who are und undocumented and have been sending home hundreds of undocumented Filipinos. These are uh, domestic helpers, Hong Kong, Dubai, and um, Singapore. On a Sunday afternoon, they have a break. Mm. I can speak for Singapore. There is freedom to go and worship on Sundays, even if um, the government encourages religious harmony so there is freedom to worship. But on, on an individual level, it depends on your employer. One of the issues there was whether to give the maid a Sunday day off. Should they be given a day off on Sunday? So <clears throat> while some employers are generous enough to give that, the maids can go to worship on Sunday. Others are unfortunate, they, they can't have it. This is a ter terrible, terrible, terrible news. This happened last year. Officials in the Philippine Embassy, they take advantage of the, the girls who couldn't go home. Um, these are girls, some of them abused in, in, in the household that they work for. They don't have money to go back and the officials in the embassy take advantage of them. They exploit them. <clears throat> they, they get them and sell them for sex in exchange for their air ticket. 
there are several layers of issues of these things. And um, I am very, very much concerned about the society that's being built by the hundreds of mothers leaving their children at home. I would say I'm, I, I'm, I'm much more fortunate that I am with my family, but of course, <clears throat> others are not because they have left their children back at home under the care of um, some other relatives. So it is very sad that the relationship now be between the parent and the child is already depending on the, the money that is being sent. I have an uncle who, who works in New Jersey. Um, he is the chaplain for the seafarers. And he says that, you know, the seamen buy um, telephone cards. They buy the telephone cards and they couldn't, of course, they couldn't leave the ship. So my uncle's, one of his duties is to bring in telephone cards so that they are able to call home. But the conversation the <clears throat> revolves around how the hard-earned money is being sent by the family. So that's a very sad thing. And can you imagine you multiply one, 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 and what values is being cultivated in this community that's being, you know, children being left behind by, by mothers or fathers, or worse, both parents. Here, I, I don't like that photo. We want our mommy home, please. Another child is going abroad the only way. <clears throat> and there's a book written about uh, stories of families left behind by the OFW mothers. So I call, I ask that we think about this millions of OFWs and um, pray that the government think about it. I, this, it's, it's years of sacrifice, perseverance, diligence, and patience, and all left to the faith that God will take care of them. I call you to pray with us. Pray with me. At the end of each prayer that I recite, I would like you to sing this phrase. Dingin mo Yahweh, dingin mo Yahweh. Sing that with me. Dingin mo Yahweh, dingin mo Yahweh. It's dingin is to hear, hear us, Lord. It's a Tagalog uh, dialect. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the government in the Philippines. Heavenly Father, source of all knowledge, grant the Philippine government the wisdom and courage to build the nation and provide jobs and lessen the OFW deployment. Give them the political will to reprimand the officials who take advantage of these OFWs, exploiting them and robbing them of their hard-earned money. Grant them understanding and compassion so that they may pay attention to the deeper implications of this OFW phenomenon and its effect on the Philippine society. We pray. Dingin mo Yahweh, dingin mo Yahweh. For the OFWs, Father, we ask that they practice discernment in their decision making. Give them alternatives so that they do not have to leave their young children. If there is no choice but for them to go far, Father, give them the strength to strive to keep the family together and instill godly values among their children. Let the relationships be based on the love of God and not their material gains. Keep the OFWs true to their marriage vows. May they not fall into temptation to seek comfort from illicit relationships. Father, hear us. Dingin mo Yahweh, dingin mo Yahweh. For the OFW children, keep them strong, dear God. 
Keep them strong and hopeful. Guide them with your light. May they be reminded to honor the Lord's Day and their seeking you week after week after week so that in the absence of their parents, they are assured of your love and faithfulness. We commit all these children into your hands, O God. Father, hear us. Ding ding For the children's guardians, may the guardians see you in the faces of these children under their care. Give them patience and kindness, and may they take joy and delight in the task given them. Father, hear us. Tingin mo For the employers, may they be empathetic to the plight of the OFW. See, may they see the OFW as people, not commodities. Embra embrace them and encourage them in their daily labor. May they exercise just labor practices. Hear us, Father. Dingin mo Dingin mo Loving God, the future is full of uncertainties. We ask that you increase our faith in you. Teach us to wait upon you, Lord, and not be weary. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to end with a song from Singapore. Um, it's written by one of our students, Pastor Lee Meng Chung. It's ascending forth. He, he did this for his graduation project. I will sing each line, and then you sing it after me. Call us forth your church. Sing. Call us forth your church. Call us forth to search. Call us forth to search. For the hungry and the helpless. For the hungry and the helpless. Call us forth your church. Call us forth your church. Send us forth your church. Send us forth your church. Send us forth to search. Send us forth to search. For the lost and for the lonely, for the lost and for the lonely, send us forth your church, send us forth your church. Let's sing three and four together. Go with us, your church. Go with us to search for the burden and the battered. Go with us, your church. Lead us forth, your church. Lead us forth to search for the poor and for the pious. Lead us forth, your church. Thank you.